I've lived in the town of Clay my whole life, and in that time, I've watched more and more friends leave New York to chase opportunity elsewhere. With Micron, all of that is changing. Onondaga County is the new land of opportunity. Micron is going to lift people out of poverty, shore up domestic supply chains, and make a difference in our community. They have already invested millions of dollars into things like workforce development and STEM education before breaking ground on a single path. Micron has developed community partnerships to address the issues most important to our residents. A project of this magnitude will present some unique challenges. We will rise to meet them every step of the way, and part of that process is listening to all of you tonight to identify any concerns that you might have. We look forward to your feedback to help guide the NEPA review process. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Deputy County Executive Brian Donnelly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Legislator uh, Kelly, for the welcome. My name is Brian Downey, I'm the Deputy County Executive. Uh, County Executive Man, unfortunately, is unable to be here this evening, but I'm honored to be here tonight uh, on his behalf to welcome everyone to this important meeting. In October of 2022, Micron announced its historic $100 billion investment in Central New York and its planned development of a leading edge semiconductor manufacturing mega campus, the expanded White Pine Commerce Park located on Route 31 here in the town of Clay. A key factor in Micron's decision to come down to Onondaga County was the unprecedented collaboration and partnership they witnessed here. In order to successfully execute on this opportunity in front of us, collaboration and partnership, especially from the community at large, is critical. Tonight commences a formal federal environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which is being led by our federal partners with the US Army, US Army Corps of Engineers. Tonight is the NEPA scoping process and meeting. Its purpose is to solicit public comments regarding items that the public would like to see considered in the federal environmental review. We look forward to working with the Army Corps and all of the involved agencies on this portion of the project. I want to thank the Town of Clay for hosting the meeting this evening. I want to thank all the elected officials who are here with us tonight. Most importantly, on behalf of County Executive McMahon, I'd like to thank each of you for being here tonight and engaging on this review process. With that being said, I'd like to turn it over now to Steve Tevier from the Army Corps of Engineers and Carson Henry with Micron, who will speak a little bit more about the project in detail in the format of tonight's meeting. Well, welcome. And uh, thank you for coming and joining today's public scoping meeting for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, on the proposed Micron Semiconductor Facility located at 5171 Route 31. My name is Steve Mativier, and I am the Chief of the Regulatory Branch for the Buffalo District. We have a lot of folks joining us here today, and my role is to make sure that all of you have equal opportunity to offer comments, and that the dialogue remains orderly and respectful. There's a few logistics to cover before we get into the details of today's meeting. There's two ways to offer comments tonight. One, is to offer verbal comments at the microphone. If you'd like to do so, I, you can either sign up or you can sign up still uh, out in, in, in the other room. And uh, the other way is uh, to submit written comments. I believe there are comment cards uh, available for people to use. If you'd like to submit a comment electronically, you may also send an email to our dedicated inbox during the comment period, which closes on April 4th, 2024. The email address is celrb-micron-public.comments at usace.army.mil. We'll have that email on the slides later. <laughs> you may also submit hard copy comments directly to the Auburn Field Office, and we'll have that address on the screen later as well. We'll have uh, the, uh, and these comments will be accepted uh, until close business on the fourth day. The fourth day, April 4th, 2024. And every public comment that we will receive, we receive, will be included in the administrative record for the project. Every public comment we receive will be part of the administrative record. Next slide, please. Okay, safety information. Here we go. So, there, yeah, so I'll look at that. So there's, there's safety doors here, uh, and uh, hopefully we don't have an issue. Uh, I think other doors open. Uh, so what we're gonna do tonight, 
Yes, uh, we have read a wide array of comments about the EIS. We ask everybody to please be respectful of others so that everyone has an equal chance to, to offer their input. Please put your cell phones on vibrate or silent, and uh, if you have to take the call, please leave the room. Please refrain from sidebar comments that may distract others from listening to comments. Please do not interrupt a speaker or otherwise talk loudly in a way that might interrupt the commenter. Please do not applaud or boo. This meeting is being transcribed and it's important that the court reporter be able to hear all commenters. And lastly, but most importantly, we ask that you assume the best in the other people around you who are here to speak tonight. We are all here to share information and learn from each other. So our agenda this evening begins with smoking remarks by me. And uh, then I will give a brief presentation outlining the Corps of Engineers permit review, the NEPA process, and the EIS scoping process and timeline. Then Mr. Carson Henry will provide a brief overview of the proposed project. And following that, I'll provide details on how to comment at this meeting's, at the evening's meeting, and we'll open the floor for public comment. So again, I'd like to welcome everyone, and thank you all for attending our public scoping meeting regarding the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers environmental impact statement for the proposed micron project. We're holding this meeting to gather input which will help us to find the scope of issues, impacts, and alternatives that will be considered in the Corps of Engineers EIS. The Corps of Engineers published the notice of intent to prepare an EIS for this project in the Federal Register on March 5th, 2024. The EIS scoping period is the part of the process in which the agency gathers input from tribal nations, agencies, interest organizations, and the general public to assist with defining the scope of impacts and alternatives to be analyzed in the EIS. The scoping period runs 30 days through April 4, 2024. Public input is a critical part of both the NEPA EIS process, and we welcome and appreciate your comments. In today's meeting, we will listen to public scoping input, but we will not respond to questions or comments. This meeting is being transcribed. The transcript will become part of the administrative records, and all comments will be considered in the preparation of the EIS. We are also accepting written comments, as I said before, through April 4th, 2024. Again, thank you, and we look forward to your input. The next few slides, I'll give you a very brief overview of our review process. This information will be very general, as the main purpose of this evening's meeting is to gather public input. I'll start with an overview of the Corps of Engineers Permit Review. The Corps of Engineers is evaluating Mike Brown's project permit application under the authority of Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, in accordance with our regulations at 33 CFR 320 to 332. Under Section 404, the Corps regulates the discharge of dredged or fill material into waters of the U.S., including wetlands. As will be shown in Mr. Henry's presentation, the proposed action will result in the filling of approximately 244 acres of wetlands and approximately 7,500 linear feet of federally regulated streams and ditches. As part of the Corps of Engineers Permit Review, we conduct a public interest review, a Section 404B1 Guidelines Compliance Review, and ensure compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act of NEPA, Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, and Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, as well as other applicable legal requirements. In addition, the Corps of Engineers consults with tribal governments throughout its review. The National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, is a procedural act that requires federal agencies to assess the environmental effects of proposed actions prior to making decisions. The Environmental Impact Statement is a document prepared in accordance with NEPA that is meant to disclose relevant information on the environmental impacts of a proposed action and reasonable alternatives. NEPA does not mandate a particular decision, but it does ensure that the public is engaged in the assessment of the agency's decision and are, and are appropriately informed. NEPA also allows for engagement of cooperating agencies to assist the lead agency throughout the EIS process. For this EIS, several federal agencies have accepted cooperating or participating agency roles and will assist the Corps of Engineers in the preparation of the EIS. The Corps of Engineers is also engaged in formal consultation with interested in tribal nations. The Corps of Engineers will complete the NEPA's process prior to making the permit decision and will use the EIS to inform its permit decision on the Mike Brown's permit application. Excellent. The Army Corps of Engineers is the lead federal agency for the EIS process. This means we are responsible for ensuring there are opportunities for public comment, and we will take the lead role in identifying topics to be investigated, and reviewed and compiling information and coordinating with the other participating agencies who will be working with us on the evaluation. Each agency has a specific role based on its mission. For example, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will be a participating agency and it has specific responsibilities and expertise with respect to Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. As stated previously, the Corps of Engineers is also consulting with tribal nations. These are areas preliminarily identified for investigation as part of the EIS process. 
As I mentioned previously, the core primary, core's primary entrance to this project is through our Section 404 permit, with emphasis, a focus on impacts to waters and wetlands. But through the EIS process, many different factors will be evaluated. Next slide. Scoping, which is where we are tonight, is the initial means for public engagement to assist federal agencies in defining the range of issues for in-depth analysis for an EIS and in identifying alternatives to be analyzed in the EIS. Some of the specific questions after the scoping comments help me answer include, one, what are the potentially significant issues that should be analyzed in depth in the EIS? What alternatives to the proposed project should be considered in the EIS? What screening criteria should be used to identify alternatives that are reasonable, which will be carried forward for analysis in the EIS? What information is available that interested parties can provide that may inform the EIS? And what additional information or analyses are needed? The Corps of Engineers published a notice of intent to prepare the EIS in the Federal Register on March 5th, 2024, and initiated the 30-day scoping period, which will run through April 4th, 2024. We encourage all interested parties to provide comments during the scoping process. Excellent. As I mentioned, the notice of intent and scoping period are early steps in the EIS process. After the close of the scoping period, the Corps of Engineers will conduct a detailed analysis of impacts and alternatives to the project and will prepare a draft EIS. The draft EIS will be available for public review and comment, and we will consider all comments received in preparation of the final EIS. The final EIS will be available to the public as well. NEPA establishes a 30-day waiting period after the publication of the final EIS before an agency can complete its record of decision. The record of decision will be the Corps' permit decision document for Micron's application and will state the Corps of Engineers' decision to either issue, issue with modifications or conditions, or deny the permit for the project. Next slide. There are several ways you can provide comments. You can submit a comment verbally at tonight's public meeting. These comments will be transcribed and included in the administrative record. You may submit written comments on the comment cards located at the signing table. You can submit email responses to our dedicated inbox listed on the screen. Finally, you can also send comments by mail to the address listed on the screen. The deadline for scoping comments is Thursday, April 4th, 2024. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Carson Henry, who will provide a brief overview of the proposed project. Following Mr. Henry's discussion, I'll provide some specifics on how to come up with a proposal at this meeting. Thank you, Steve, and good evening, everybody. Just before I talk about Micron, the town hall wanted to remind everyone that while there's a door back there that's very convenient to get out to the parking lot, it's a convenient way to also invite first responders that don't want to show up this way. So please use the entrances and exits that you see over here when you're ready to leave the building. With that, I'd like to talk a little bit about Micron. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is a bit of an overview about our company. It started in a basement of a dentist's office back in Boise over 40 years ago, and since then it's grown to be a multinational corporation leading in the memory space on technology and one of the largest semiconductor manufacturers in the world. Go to the next slide. And this is where we plan to build our future. So this dot here shows where we plan to put the campus, and if you go to the next slide, we'll show a little bit more about what the campus looks like. So the border you can see is outlined in this sort of orange color, and the child care center, which we consider part of the product, is to the northeast, or excuse me, northwest. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like on a coming slide. You can also see here the different off-site utility lines that will feed the campus. The slide is one of those going into a little bit more detail. The inlet that's in the upper left-hand corner shows the water lines, which will go from Lake Ontario for roughly 26 miles to site. There's already an existing water line that goes right into the site today that will be relocated slightly to the south and top border of the site. Go to the next slide. And this is a little bit more about the project. So if you click down, you'll be able to see the site map. So this shows the four fab layout that we plan to build, and on the upper part of it, or the northern part, you can see the right-of-way for the existing high-voltage power lines. We plan to start construction in early 2025 with fab one and fab two both operational by the end of the decade. And that's a pull-in from our previous plan. It's a response to increased demand that we're seeing in the market from artificial intelligence and other applications. 
and then fabs three and four we plan to build by 2035 and 2041. Um, in terms of the scope, it hasn't changed from what we have talked about in the past uh, for six hundred thousand square foot clean rooms and supporting buildings. And um, the campus will have the, all these offsite utilities and substations and things like that we mentioned on the, the previous slide. If we go to the next slide, I'd like to show a conceptual site plan for the child care center. Uh, so the child care center will be open around the time that we start um, that we start operation for the fab. So it'll be there for the team members that we hire. And as we scale, we plan to have a family health care center for our team members as well. And then because it is a relatively large site, we have some additional space that we'd like to put recreation fields uh, for the enjoyment of our team members as well. For the offsite improvements, um, step through these one by one. The first one is the industrial wastewater expansion. So this will have different lines that are that convey industrial wastewater to the or ocean or orchard and treatment center um, where wastewater will be treated. And then as much as possible, there'll be uh, a line that conveys wastewater back to the site for recycling. So we'll try to use as much wastewater as we can um, in our operation as part of our sustainability goals. Can you go to the next slide, please? Natural gas line, so there'll be a 16 inch line that's run along this path that you see here. Uh, and that will be attached to a, um, a gas regulation station that already exists. Go to the next slide. And these are the offsite improvements. So there's an existing 54 inch water line that runs through site. That's what I mentioned earlier. Um, there'll be some additional infrastructure that's required for the volumes that we use. And then we'll build at the right time an additional 54 inch line through existing right of ways, uh, and it'll go parallel to the existing line um, for the vast majority of the, the length of pipe. Uh, so that one extra Y that sort of goes out to the west that you see um, on Lake Ontario, that's also through an existing right of way. And then on electricity, so right across the, the street from the campus is the Clay New York substation. Um, we will tap into that substation, and there'll be eight lines, two per fab. So two is needed for redundancy. Those will go through underground duct banks, as will the rest of the utilities, by the way. They'll all be buried in some different way. Uh, and they'll feed the campus. And then fiber. Um, this is the last of the major utilities. This, this um, utility already has connection points to the, clay New York, to the clay substation. And then there's also fiber that runs along uh, Route 31. So, any disturbance on this will go through existing road right of ways, um, be pretty minimal considering most of it's done through direction really. And then the wetland side, so as Steve mentioned, there's a significant amount of wetlands on site. Our mission first is to try to avoid those as much as possible. So while we don't have a site plan that overlays these wetlands here, um, if we look back at the map that we had, you'll notice that it shifted to the southwest as much as possible, and that's because you can see the blue delineated wetlands here, they're mostly to the north and to the east. So that site plan um, that minimizes the amount of impact that we have. The other thing the, other, uh, the site plan does is it's very dense. So we try to pack the buildings as close as possible. That's good when it comes to energy usage because we want the utilities as close to the source as possible. It reduces the amount of energy it takes for conveyance. Um, we'll also have parking garages which minimizes the impact that we have and also uh, for upstate New York and weather like this um, reduces the amount of time that people have to dust off their car. Good, next slide. And then um, as I think Steve mentioned, right, the acreages are here and we're working on different uh, methods to go and mitigate the impacts that we will have to use. So with that, let me turn it back over to Steve. Thanks, Carson. So I was remiss earlier. Uh, I wanted to recognize uh, our uh, Deputy Commander uh, for the District, Dave Schoenberg, is here this evening. So, uh, thank you, Dave, for coming out from the public. So now that you've heard an overview of the project and the purpose of today's meeting, we want to pass the mic to you and get your input on potentially significant effects due to the proposed project, areas for in-depth analysis uh, within the draft EIS, the project purpose and need, alternatives to the project, alternative screening criteria, the relevant points for consideration in the draft EIS. As a reminder, there's two ways to offer comments. One is verbally at the, at the podium, and the second is to fill out the comment card book and get the sign-up table. To make sure as many commenters as possible get the chance to speak today, we're limiting each person's comments to two minutes. There's a countdown timer, as you can see, and to show you how much time you have left during your submitted period, so please be respectful of other people's time and wrap up your comments when prompted. 
It's Judy Boyke. I am a previous supervisor of the town of Cicero and town counselor. I'm also a licensed realtor for the last 30 years. I have also worked for General Electric and I have my own business. Um, my biggest concern right now in two minutes is going to be too short. The wetlands is a natural catch, catch basin for our runoff and the streams that are naturally there. The biggest concern is when Micron came or is coming announcement that folks who lived in the area were asked to sell their homes and if they didn't they were convinced to sell their homes. Um, the folks that live in the wetlands and the forest uh, have not been asked anything about moving and they will never be told or provided where they're going. So folks, get ready, they're coming in your backyards. Bats is not a funny thing. Bats is very serious. And they are endangered along with several species of plants that are in the area. Um, I find it hard to believe that Micron is green exempt when we are forced to be looking at everything electric. It's not gonna change the delivery, and they want us to use less, but they're still gonna charge us more than the uses that we have. I would like to see solar panels on the top of all of the microns have something uh, better than tarvia and roof runoff to be flooding all of the areas that's gonna happen if everyone has seen what happened when Amazon didn't do their homework. Um, I have a property that has wetlands on it, and I tried to fill 10 feet. I put a permit in, I went through all the natural process. I was denied because there were cattails on my property. So how is it possible that you can move this amount of acreage that is being talked about that is natural drainage, the forest that we need was trees that provide oxygen so we can breathe. No trees, no oxygen. So I guess it doesn't matter because we'll all be dead. Um, with that said, I know that other folks have got things to say. I have more, but I'll wait until I get another chance if possible. Thank you very much. Check one, two. Dan Troiano, D-A-N-T-R-O-I-A-N-O. -O. Spell this, hexamethyldisilazane. Like Toxic waste product produced in chip etching. Burned by thermal oxidizers, released into the air, comes back down in the form of crystalline silica, carcinogen, scars lung tissue. Worse than coal dust, fatal lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis, three years, you're dead. Bad headaches, etc. What are you gonna do with this stuff? So come right back down, you're gonna breathe it. Bad odors, headaches, coughing, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, seizures of windpipes, plus 130 of the most deadly chemicals and gases known to mankind. Miscarriages, infertility, breast cancer, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, reproductive toxins, congenital malformations, brain tumors. Examples from Korea, Taiwan, UK, and US. Chip manufacturing. Yeah, I can keep on going. California, Silicon Valley. More hazardous waste funds, super fun hazardous waste sites than any other place in the United States. Silicon Valley. Number two, who's gonna protect the United Lake? The United River, all the tributaries. I drink out of a well. What do you guys drink? You wanna drink out of the Oswego River? Be my guest, I'll put my well water up against any of that water. What about the walleyes? They're already getting kicked in the ass because there's no snow on there. What about climate change? All right, where's all the, where's all the ice fishing? $500,000 homes being built around my house, everywhere. My taxes are gonna go through the roof. That's fine, that's fine, water tower landing. What are, you, what are they gonna breathe? You're gonna spend a half a million dollars on a house, walk outside, you can't breathe in the morning? Where's this air gonna go? How far is it gonna away? This is seven miles away from Micron, as the crow flies. Where does the pollution go, which direction? All right, let's keep it going. Uh, drink the water, uh, the water table. You're gonna suck how many million gallons out of that lake and out of that river every day? What's it gonna to do to the surrounding water table? You don't have the snowpack anymore. So start sucking some more water out and see what happens. Yeah, all right, sure. Hey, how about number three? Who cleans up the mess with the accidents? 
Micron's got to have all this crap, all these, all these chemicals, all these gases. 130 of the most deadly chemicals and gases known to mankind. Please wrap up your, please wrap up your comments. Uh, secrecy. This industry is shrouded in secrecy. Don't take my word for it. Go take a look at a digital equipment corporation, Albany Times, Federal Agency for Toxic Substances Disease Reports Registry in Atlanta. We already have to pay for all the electric school buses. We have to pay for electric stoves. 16 inch natural gas line. I got more. You may certainly have submitted a, a written or, or email comment as well. My name is John Harmon. I represent the United Lake Association. And actually, I'm here to uh, distribute a written report, which I've done because our report is quite lengthy. But uh, in, briefly, in summary, this lake is only four miles from the proposed site, and we, we strongly urge the developers and the association and, and Micron uh, as they move forward to keep this lake in mind. Uh, it's a, a tremendous natural resource. Uh, our organization includes 2,500 members and thousands of other family uh, family members and friends. And as I said, you know, we urge you to keep this this lake in mind. Uh, we enjoy uh, the beauty of the lake, the natural resources. You heard the walleyes mentioned, uh, but swimming, sailing, the fresh water is a clean lake. So you know, it's a treasure that we've been. Uh, the steward of for the last eight years almost. Our, our organization was founded in 1945, and we've, we've kept track of the health of that lake for, for that many years, and we'd like to, uh, to maintain that treasure moving forward. The rest of my comments are in the written report that I've submitted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sue Ray Light. And John Hughes on deck. Well, I guess I'm sort of the odd person out. I do want the project to succeed and to exist. Because I have two children, one who now lives in New Jersey and the other in Virginia. My son, who was here one time, uh, went at the, at the time the carousel existed this carousel, went to the sixth floor of carousel, because you could do that at one time. And looked out over Syracuse and said, hmm, an industrial city with no industry, which is why he's in New Jersey, uh, works in Manhattan. But I'm here for a sort of a different reason. I see the Army Corps of Engineers. I grew up, incidentally, in Miami. I did not grow up here, but I went to Syracuse University and stayed here. Every time I see the Army Corps of Engineers, I tremble uh, because of what they've done to the Everglades. And if any of you are familiar with the Kissimmee River, do you know about the Kissimmee River? Yeah. Well, they're still working on fixing the Kissimmee River and the Everglades after the, after the Army Corps of Engineers has worked on it. I understand as of 20, in 2021, they finally have finished the Kissimmee River a restoration to the tune of $980 million after the Army, after the Army Corps of Engineers channelized a meandering river and deepened it to make it into a canal. Now, they didn't do this because they wanted to. They were asked to do this for flood control. Every time anyone mentions flood control, immediately be suspicious because it's gonna, it's gonna be bollocks, but it's not gonna work. One thing to remember about our area is very similar to our area to what's going on here. What's going on, um, our area is very much like the area because the Kissimmee River feeds into the Everglades just as we feed into Lake Ontario. We have to be careful about that. I want to have someone overseeing what's going on with the Army Corps of Engineers and then the leads on this project. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. This is Don, as in Donald. And no, I'm not a duck. Um, I'm here to represent the uh, Central and Northern New York group of the Sierra Club. Uh, Sierra Club is a national organization with over half a million uh, members, and it's the oldest um, environmental group in this country. Um, I want to focus on uh, chemicals. Um, I'm a chemist, so, but there, as the second gentleman pointed out, there's, there's a lot of hazardous chemicals associated with semiconductor manufacturing. Um, Micron will be using a variety of these substances. I was just about to add a talk from uh, Mr. Henry um, this morning, talking about perfluorinated compounds. Uh, many of these things are gases, like tri, um, <clears throat> like tetrafluoromethane. Um, they are planning to incinerate this, these chemicals. 
um, and then it will be emitted into the air. Um, I urge that the environmental impact statement look at the health impacts of these chemicals. It is, they're often shrouded in mystery. There are claims of confidentiality. We need to know what the chemicals are, how they're gonna be monitored, what they're turning into. This is not easy. Same concerns for chemicals that are going into the wastewater. There's a whole host of perfluorinated compounds. These things are toxic at levels of parts per trillion. To get a handle on that, that's 500 gallons mixed in with all of Lake Ontario. That's one part per trillion. And these things are very hazardous. So we need to, in the environmental impact statement, look at health effects. Don't just assume they're maybe toxic or don't go with we don't know what they are. It's important that we find out what they are and quantify to the best ability what the health risk is, what the impact on the environment from all these chemicals is. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Wood. That's J-I-M-W-O-O-D. I'm a licensed uh, professional engineer in New York State and just wanted to uh, have the question presented that with the burning of uh, so much natural gas in a 16-inch gas main, uh, the court should look at whether or not these fabrication buildings are going to incorporate uh, CHP or combined heat and power uh, to reclaim the waste heat to generate electricity. Uh, that's good for the environment. It is also critical for the transmission grid that goes across New York State that uh, this facility will be, be tying into because that is rapidly going to reach capacity and then you know lights go out uh, that, that's a big concern and with a lot of engineers um, and in addition to the CHP to generate electricity on site uh, they should put as much solar and or geothermal on site to also offset their energy use uh, if they're Mala microns Malaysian plant they just finished uh, installing 36,000 solar panels, which goes a long way. It won't cover everything, but it will help the congestion on the transmission grid. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Hello, sir. John Egan, E-A-G-A-N, from the Lower Street today. Um, I'm not for anti-micron, but I was concerned with some statements I see as far as environmental impact or uh, some of the historic properties in that area. Uh, the bike ride doesn't come to the town of play by chance. What do we do with those, that property and all the properties taken from uh, people, the residents, and the community right there? And as far as the uh, Army Corps engineers studying this, researching the watershed, which I understand has to be done, I wasn't as far as considered in 2022 <coughs> when the uh, proposed project was you know, set up for the county to take a look at. Uh, we got this, obviously, a big issue there. We have pop properties and family taken uh, back to say 20 years ago, only roughly. One of the most historical uh, homes in the town of Clay that was devastated right to the ground. It was over 20 years ago in the intimate domain. So I'm concerned with that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm also certified in the United States and Canada for the welding, which is what my crown does, clean room, clean room design. So, Locally, um, for the tradesmen in the area and tradesmen from other states that would come in here, it would be great for, for that purpose. Other than that, I see the concerns for the people here, kind of chemical and you know, distribution of waste product. Um, that is a great concern for all of us, I'm sure. Uh, my biggest point is now that we're studying the environmental impact, I really concerned as to why we wait so long. The county's invested millions of dollars into this property and we don't have a guarantee obviously and um there's other places where some of these millions of dollars could have been stuck with so i would like to look at that i'd like to um you know see why we're studying researching things like to understand the bad needs of places to live <coughs> if he's indigenous to here i can understand that if he's not indigenous to this area if we're going to build a plant let's build a plant so um like I say, my basic concern was if my crown does not come in here, what do we do with all that property? Are we going to divvy it up? Are we going to give it back to the people that owns there? 
what do we really do with that wasted um, time, effort, and where are we going to go with it in that respect? Thank you much. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Dory Joyner, D O R I J O I N E R. I am the president of Onondaga Audubon. I'm here tonight representing Onondaga Audubon to express our concerns over the environmental impact of Micron's plan to fill in 244 acres of federally regulated wetlands and also the regulated streams and dishes. Um, the mission of Onondaga Audubon is to encourage the conservation of birds and wildlife native to central and northern New York. A large number of native birds, animals, insects, and plants rely on wetland habitats for their survival. Because of this, Onondaga Audubon feels responsible for safeguarding this habitat, which is increasingly being infringed upon. We must strive to protect this precious resource. For the wetlands in question at the Micron site, we want to be sure that Micron's mitigation plan will be an appropriate substitute and that the compensatory plan is put in place before the present habitat is damaged and lost. It is essential to the project to protect all the species that have been affected and most importantly to safeguard the two species of bats that are uh, federally endangered. Um, we have many questions and concerns about the details of the compensatory wetland plan, such as the timing, location, extent, and quality of the replaced wetland. Also, who will ensure that Micron will fulfill its responsibility to provide an appropriate substitute for the wetlands that they will take over. There's no question that the Micron plant will provide an economic boom to New York State and our local Onondaga County, but we don't want to. Um, thank you. Hey there, everyone. Uh, Jacob Gigler Dash Caro. I'm a hypocrite. A lot of us are hypocrites. I use microchips. I love my smartphone. I use my computer for work. All these things are great. Jobs are awesome. But I care more about the quality of our water and my parent or my children, my grandchildren's um, water quality than I do. Um, around the consumption of our digital media and our uh, computers and our technology, right? So um, when it comes to this wetland conversation and the environmental impact study, I think it's really important uh, to realize that water will go somewhere, right? So um, you mentioned in the slide that there is you know, the wetlands are in the northeast and you're gonna build here and parking garages and that's cute, right? But that water, that rainwater is gonna fall um, and go into those wetlands. And then if you're covering up wetlands, great, that water's gonna go somewhere else. And that water's gonna go into the community's backyards, hence the Amazon project, right? That we're all familiar with by now. Um, so keeping things in mind about potential, like, okay, if this happens, um, like think about permeable uh, pavers, right? How do you keep water in place on the facility so it could actually sink into the ground, right? Um, if you're gonna mitigate wetlands, um, you know, really, I, I, I think it's really important for us to, I'm gonna write a better statement uh, written, but I think this is more a message for the room is like, these things are great, but these things are poison. Um, and we really need to be thinking more about our ecological communities beyond um, just our day-to-day -day, uh, Panera Breads. Yeah, all right. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Jim Nistico, let me see. I, um, my, my writing's like chicken scratch. And I just wanted to uh, just say, say a few words. Um, Obviously, this is an enormous opportunity for this county and central New York, including the town of Clay. I am a resident in the town of Clay, and as well as a business owner. I live about a quarter of a mile away from, from the, where the plant is gonna be. 
Um, obviously, the micron needs to be stewards of the uh, property, of course, uh, but it seems like from what I've heard thus far that uh, they're willing to work with the Army Corps and you know, the local ecology just to make sure that uh, you know everything is on the up and up and, and uh, if there's anything that they need to tweak, I'm sure they're willing to tweak. Um, and I'll, let, I'll leave with one last comment. When uh, we had a meeting here in October 2022, uh, April Arzen of uh, the CPO of Micron, uh, I remember very distinctly she said that she lives close enough to the Boise, Idaho plant that she could siphon off their Wi-Fi. While she may have a glowing personality, I don't think the rest of her is glowing. Um, so I think, you know, Micron has been overall safe. Um, but obviously, you have to work together, um, and uh, we can have a major success in this area. Thank you. My name is John Prespiora, I'm a resident of the city of Syracuse, and I'm here representing Greening USA and other organization partners known as the Sustainability Coalition. Uh, the scope of the proposed NEPA <laughs> review must be comprehensive. The scale of the proposed action is enormous, and the review of the potential impacts, direct, indirect, and cumulative, must be equally robust. We want to be sure that it is undertaken in a thoughtful way and not detrimental to the environment, that it is sustainable in the broadest sense of the word, and that it is that its short and long-term effects on our region's land, water, air, and residents are fully understood and anticipated. If on balance, the adverse impacts are unsustainable to the detriment of the region's health, safety, and welfare, and not impart imparted to the community in a just and equitable manner, the project must be modified, reduced, or possibly denied. <laughs> We believe this project presents significant opportunities, but it comes with tremendous challenges. Limiting the scope uh, of, the, of the review to the fab development and operation and the related infrastructure is short-sighted and must be broadened to include the proximate supply chain developments anticipated, as well as the housing and community services necessary to support the population growth expected from workers and their families um, that will construct, operate, and serve the needs of the community. We want to be sure that the Corps of Engineers recognizes that, that, that the indirect impact components um, are thoroughly studied. The broad anticipation uh, listed in the NOI and, uh, seemingly coincides with our position. However, we want to be sure that uh, social and economic conditions are reviewed. Sir, thoroughly. so I please for your comments. Okay, I have other things to say, and I will submit them to you, you. Uh, in writing. Perfect. Thank you, sir. My name is Frank Shortino. I'm employed with my wife Elaine. Elaine and I are not opposed to the project. However, we do face the potential for significant impact to the character of our neighborhood and the value of our property if the Micron project is approved. We live on the corner of Burplank Road and Van Hosen Road and the potential impacts we face are traffic related and directly associated with the plans for improvements to local roads, namely Codnoy Road, Mud Mill Road, Burplank Road, and Van Hosen Road. The impact on traffic paragraph in the notice of intent to prepare DEIS dated September 14, 2023, identifies several areas of concern. One, construction and operation of the proposed Micron project is expected to generate a substantial number of new vehicular trips on the local and regional highway network, including local roads, I-81, and New York State Route 481. Two, approximately 12,000 parking spaces are proposed for the facility. Three, there are approximately 10 to 30 commercial trucks per peak hour anticipated during operation of the proposed facility. Four, additional vehicles are anticipated for construction over the approximately 20 year build out and five, modification of existing roads is anticipated. 
We request that the EIS address and provide specific details for the proposed improvements to the local roads named above. Details regarding the size, number of lanes, speed limits, expected volume of traffic, and expected changes to the surrounding neighborhoods, along with a specific timetable for the proposed improvements, must be provided in order to honestly assess the potential impacts and give the surrounding residents adequate notice of the changes they face. Anything less will be deemed un unacceptable and a failure to address one of the most significant impacts associated with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Loomis. Alice. And I just wanted to be sure that, uh, that you knew that I'm terrified of this project because of the impact uh, to the water and the air, like I already heard, lots of toxins, lots of uh, poisons, and I just hope it doesn't permanently destroy our, our ability to live here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Judson, uh, T-I-M-J-U-D-S-O-N, and I'm the chair and the kind of co-founder of the Alliance for Green Economy. Um, and we're here tonight to urge that the, this uh, EIS have as comprehensive a scope as possible for all the reasons that people talked about here tonight. Um, including, you know, the, everything from the energy usage to the water impacts to the community impacts. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, I, I, you know, I moved here 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And I spent the first few years um, of my time living in Syracuse, um, sort of trying to figure out, like, what was wrong with this place. Um, and I say that somewhat facetiously because, you know, what I eventually figured out was there isn't anything wrong with this place. This is, this is, a, this is an amazing, resilient community. Um, but we've been beaten up for over a century. Um, we've been abandoned by tons of corporations that took away really good jobs. People had fought to make good jobs for a long time and left us with incredible amounts of pollution. And um, you know, I have a couple of visuals here I want to share. Um, one is a map of all the Superfund sites in the Syracuse area. We have dozens of them. One of the highest concentrations of Superfund sites in the country. We have a beautiful lake, which is one of the most historic, significant places in the country um, that hasn't been able to be swim or fished in for over a century. We're not going to let this happen to you. And so with all of the issues that people have raised tonight about the incredible amount of toxic chemicals that this facility is going to use and process and incinerate, the tremendous uh, risk to our water supply, um, you know, we, we're not going to let that happen here. And so we need for this EIS to be as comprehensive as possible in analyzing the impacts. And so, you know, and I'll say the same conclusion, that we, this place, Syracuse is one of the, was one of the birthplaces of the chemical industry. We have seen what happens when chemicals are not properly regulated and, and the community is protected. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Robert Weigert. I am uh, the owner of uh, real property on Rue 11 on the east side of uh, uh, this project. And uh, the environmental impact is going to come down hard on, on me and my warehouse and my property on Route 11. So I want to bring to the attention um, of uh, the Corps of Engineers that there is a problem uh, with the sewer system along Route 11 um, on the east side of this project. Uh, we have the lakeshore of Sanitary District coming up from the south, but it dead ends at uh, the commons. Um, and uh, coming down from the north, the Brewerton Sanitary District uh, ends at Mud Mill Road. And in between Mud Mill and Southern District, um, I'm on septic tank right now. And I don't have <coughs> open water. I have a well. Um, I have a uh, warehouse there is 4,800 square feet and it's on six, more than six acres. And uh, this uh, project is going to affect me personally. Uh, so I want to bring that to the attention of the Corps of Engineers 
So when they find this little problem, and Micron finds that the Orchard Park isn't big enough for them, um, that they're going to have a problem. Thank you, sir. My name is Paul Fritzen. It's spelled P-A-U-L. And I'm just a guy who loves the water. I grew up fishing on Cayuga Lake with my grandfather. I grew up swimming in Oneida Lake and Silver Beach with my father. I just caught my first Chinook salmon this year up at the Oswego River. And I do support this project. I'm an engineer, I know how important it is that we need. But as an avid fisherman, I also know just how far of a reach something like a chemical spill could go. I've named a lot of lakes, but there's one I've never set so much as my pinky toe in. And I know that the reach of the pollution of Onondaga Lake stretches far further than the lake. So, I would implore the Army Corps to research just how far of an environmental impact could happen in a worst case scenario, as well as a more realistic scenario from putting this fabrication plant at Oak Park. Because I do know that Oneida Lake and the Oneida River flows into the Seneca River, which then forms into the Oswego River. It also flows into Onondaga Lake, out to Cross Lake, and then into Cayuga Lake, and then into Seneca Lake. Those are some of the largest freshwater bodies in our state and North America. And I can tell you from talking to other people in the angling community all over the world, they're very jealous of the blessing that we have in our fresh water. So I again implore the Army Corps to research just how far of an impact this will have, because I assure you it will go well beyond the town play. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Michelle Easley, and my, my biggest concern, and everyone that's had the time to talk, I agree with a lot of their points. I don't want to rehash the same thing, but my biggest problem is the pollution. It is going to affect us. Wildlife, our waters, and if you try to fill in a massive area that you're trying to talk about right now, you're going to have the water spill into my backyard, my house. I live in Burton. I travel down Mud Mill and all these back roads. And all these areas have a lot of children. Do you know how many school districts are in this area where you're planning on putting this massive amount of buildings? You know, we have school districts where the kids are going to be involved in playing, so that's a huge thing. Did you talk to the farmers, the rest of their land, that you're going to mess up too when you do this? So it goes far scope. So the information that's been brought to you by not only myself, but everybody else, my biggest fear is you're going to ruin our water and our ground, our soil, our animals, and the rest of our health. Big, big time. And then I'm going to need a helipad in my yard just to travel in the traffic. Do you even know on a good day you cannot get through Route 31? It backs up. So where am I going to go? Are you going to build a helicopter for me too? All of us are going to be trapped and stuck in dead lock all the way from 31 on the back routes and all the way through from the mall, Liverpool, it's going to bother us all the way to Bonesville, you name it. Every direction, every route, everybody's got to travel. So take that as a point too. I'm totally against this whole entire project. I am, I'm totally not for it because there's nothing good that's gonna help, nothing. Nobody, traffic, water, our children, and our health. I'm sorry, that's not all I have to say. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Kevin Stack, and I'm here speaking directly to the EIS. I'm asking that the environmental impact statement looks closely at the existing structure, its function of existing biodiversity of the wetlands and the impact of the compositional changes resulting from anthropogenic formation. Any offsets if allowed should be held to the same measure of the existing wetlands, ecological performance standards, and perpetuality. Biodiversity loss is the primary driver of loss of ecosystem functioning which all life depends, and we consider the impact of those not yet born and those who are born. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Siegel, I'm at the Center for Public Environmental Oversight in Mountain View, California, the birthplace of the semiconductor industry. 
Um, most people don't realize that the semiconductor industry is essentially a chemical industry, and we're still cleaning up spills and other contamination released in my community several decades ago. Today, the semiconductor industry claims that the use of perfluorinated compounds, PFAS, are essential to the industry, yet they're virtually unregulated. Most of them have not been studied. So it's important that the EIS identify all of the chemicals to which people might be exposed through the water or the air by the industry. They say it's a lot of it is confidential business information. It really shouldn't be because we don't need to know the formulas. We just need to know what they use and what, what might be released into your community like it was released into my community. There are three things I'd like to see in the EIS. One is transparency. Identify what the risks are for this project. Secondly, to identify all of the permits that Micron is going to be obtaining to make this project work. Uh, not just a list of permits, but a calendar, so the community knows how to file comments on each one as they come up. And third, you should identify best management practices so that the CHIPS office in its grant agreement to, to Micron, which Micron is counting on, will be able to be required to do the kind of say, wastewater pretreatment that will address PFOS in a way that it doesn't destroy uh, your release contamination into your wastewater plant into the biosolids that might be used on farmland. So again, this is a, a chemical industry that has to be controlled and the community has to be engaged all along from the EIS throughout the operation of the plant and managing its wastes. Thank you. My name is Sophia Cavallari. There are so many environmental impacts that are concerning in this project, but one of them, one of them being the federal, federally protected bats. They are an endangered and threatened species in the area and throughout the country. The Indiana bats and northern long-eared bats have been declining throughout the country, but they are a vital impact for the environment. That save billions of dollars for, farm, for farmers dealing with pests and disease-carrying insects and much more. Micron needs to fund mitigation plans to help protect the bats if they're going to take their habitat. Thank you very much. Names of, uh, of people who wanted to who wanted to speak. It's time if there are no more. Uh, if there are those who wanted to supplement their issue, yes, ma'am. Really about what appears to me to be the lack of planning for all of the employee traffic. I don't understand why you are not working with our Centro and other motor transportation systems to utilize them instead of planning for 12,000 parking spaces for all these individual cars and employee cars. Um, I'm hoping that you will change your mind and start working with our transportation people so that we don't have all of those cars coming and going from the plant. The other thing I wanted to say is that I'm concerned that I've been at a couple of these meetings and I have never heard anyone here speaking on behalf of either the Oneida or Onondaga Nation. I asked our county executive about that at a panel meeting, and he said that's because I haven't invited them. I'm hoping that you will engage with them because they, more than any other body that you talked about, they are the leaders in <coughs> ecological work. They are leading naturalists, and by choosing not to invite them, it's a valuable resource that is being ignored. Dan Wheeler. Okay, I live on one bell road with my head. My, my property immediately joined the yeah. micron now. I'm concerned with filling in all the lead mines if I'm going to end up with a swamp or a lake. And I'm on well water, which is going to do as well. You know, I have animal picking and ponds and the ponds are going to strike one. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Let me see that again. The CHIPS Act, the federal 
subsidies for the microelectronics industry is a great opportunity as evidenced by the environmental impact statement that you're working on. That for the first time, the government is more involved in planning for these plants before they get built. So I see this great opportunity to improve the environmental record of the semiconductor industry. I am part of a national coalition, Chips Communities United, that brings together labor and environmental groups throughout the country in places where the semiconductor industry has been and places where it's going. So again, I, I hope you all view this as an opportunity to improve this industry. Uh, it's gonna be around, but is it, because of its difficult past record, it needs the government to be more involved to make sure that it does the right thing. You can't rely on the companies to do the right thing on their own, even if some of the people in the companies are trying to do it. Because the people who design the factories aren't the people who are responsible within the companies for making sure that environmental safety, environment, safety, and health are followed properly. Thank you. Judy Boyke again. Uh, I'll try not to take time. I am a, a Nida Lake resident, and I am also a member of the Nida Lake Association. That is one of my concerns as well. But I have a couple of other questions. Um, who's paying for the water line, the sewer line, the Oak Orchard Improvement Plant, the gas line, and the new power lines that are being, uh, that have to be brought in order to start this project? Um, from what I heard, it, my understanding that Micron talked about it, but according to all of the uh, publicity that we've seen, it's a, going to be on the taxpayers' back. Um, I also been a realtor, so housing is always been a major concern. Now all of a sudden, it's a big concern, even though we have seniors who have been waiting for housing forever. And now, it's not the seniors, other than they want them to sell their house and move into a house or a project so that they can give their house to the Micron people is ridiculous and insulting. Um, and no one's talked about traffic, especially in Cicero. Cicero is going to be the hub because it is Route 81. This whole project, the horse has been in front of the, or the car's been in front of the horse since day one. The government is involved, but they're not involved with the people. They're involved with their own power. Thank you. Uh, I just didn't have time to talk about anything other than chemicals, so I just want to add my voice that um, certainly the Sierra Club is in favor of protecting wetlands, protecting endangered species. We would love to see the plans that mitigating, not mitigating factors, but let's think about actually reducing the footprint. Do we really need 12,000 parking spaces? Maybe we could build it a little bit smaller. Maybe we could have public transportation so that people don't have to drive individual cars back and forth. And it's very important that we take into consideration the urban communities, the people that live in Syracuse and in other urban centers that have frequently, that have frequently imposed on them by environmental pollution, so-called environmental justice communities, that they are given the opportunity to work at this facility and enjoy the economic benefit. So let's take sustainability to heart when you're building this thing. Thank you. John Presbior, once again, uh, thanks for the opportunity to come back up. And I'll say thanks to everybody for being here and for making your comments. It's inspiring to hear um, your concerns about this project. Uh, I want, just want to finish a couple of things that I didn't get a chance to finish up before. Uh, and we've heard most of this stuff, but let me just say, you know, it's, the chip manufacturing use utilizes large amounts of hazardous chemicals. We've heard about that. It uses a large amount of uh, energy, a large amount of water, um, and in addition will create the significant vehicular traffic and itself will have significant environmental impacts. Together, these impacts pose significant threats 
uh, to the environment that have to be understood before permitting such a project uh, to, to go forward. The community deserves nothing less. Um, my friend Lenny uh, Siegel advised me a bit about fluorinated chemicals. Um, these uh, are, are known as forever chemicals and they're a primary concern for chip manufacturing. Existing regulations are not up to the challenge which these substances pose. Uh, to gain assurance that these chemicals are kept from contaminating the environment, um, it is suggested that total organic fluoride uh, should be uh, uh, controlled. There are technologies for measuring it. EPA or other regulators should adopt uh, standard methods and technologies for both monitoring total organic uh, fluoride. Uh, but in the absence of such a global regulatory scheme, um, is it possible to attach permit conditions to exceed existing regulatory standards should this project uh, be permitted to go um, forward? Energy usage will be significant. At a time when governmental policy is to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gases, where will the renewable electricity come from? Thank you, sir. Oh, I did just I just wanted to say one more thing. Uh, the fisherman fellow, can you, can oh you yeah, Jacob, Jacob giggler Paro, um, again, uh, the fisherman fellow who came up here mentioned, you know, really looking into what the worst case scenario might be as well. Um, you know, mitigation plans and the environmental uh, study might just say, oh, in an event of, you know, four inch rain event, no big deal, all right, this is where the water is gonna go. But uh, having lived in Northern Wisconsin on the South Shore of Lake Superior in 2017, I experienced 16 inches of rain in three hours. Um, and it took roads out, it took out uh, infrastructure, it polluted rivers, um, so just like, Think about those things. What's the worst case scenario, right? What happens if we get rained on for, you know, we have a big 500 year storm event? Thank you. My name is Jim Lindenbach. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any way to take, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a before and after picture of the surrounding wetlands? I'm pretty sure the core will do that. Can you do it in such a way that we can all understand? Um, in other words, a clear, a clear delineation of you know where exactly they are, what they look like now, what are they going to look like when this project is completed? And I'd like to say thank you to Micron for coming this afternoon. Uh, everybody who's signed up and uh, everybody uh, who's who's come up to the podium. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending our meeting tonight. We appreciate the opportunity to hear your comments on the proposed project and to assist us in defining the scope of the EIS. If you have any additional comments, you may submit them by writing in by April 4th, 2024. We'll consider all comments received verbally today and all written comments submitted during the comments. Thank you again.